This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about The Testament of Dr. Mabuse from 1933, directed by Fritz Lang. And we're joined by a Patreon co-host, Ryan Norris. Hi, Ryan. Mm. <laughs> yo, yo, what's good? God, uh, not much, not much. <laughs> not we're talking. We're, <laughs> we're talking about Doctor Mabuse or Mabuse. Which which one do you prefer, guys? Mabuse or Mabuse? Uh, whatever, I. Whatever, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You can say whatever tickles the art house people's fancy. You know, I uh, I thought it was Mabuse, and then uh, throughout the course of the films we watched, I I believe it's Mabuse. Mm-hmm. Mabuse. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm with you, Ryan. Whatever, whatever people want is fine. Mabuse? Mabuse? Whatever you guys go with, whatever. Mabuse caboose. Sure, that too. Or as uh, I mentioned last week in the uh, the wrap-up, that when I sent M- Mabuse to RJ, I came back as Dr. Manure. Yeah, he's like, when are you going to watch those Dr. Manures? And I was like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? <laughs> It's a true story. True story. The tagline for this film, gents, madman, monster, murderer, scientist. Whoa. Whoa. Very, it, was all, it was very alliterative to that last one. Mm-hmm. And the synopsis, Not- synopsis from Letterboxd. After a detective is assaulted by thugs and placed in an insane asylum run by Professor Baum, he observes the professor's preoccupation with another patient, the criminal genius Dr. Mabuse, the hypnotist. Mm. When Mabuse's notes are found to be connected with a rash of recent crimes, Commissioner Lohman must determine how Mabuse is communicating with the criminals despite conflicting reports on the doctor's whereabouts and capture him for good. So... Testament of Dr. Mabuse. This is a movie that's been on my radar for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. It's it's Fritz Lang. It's 1933. It has a really cool cover from the, on the Criterion DVD with all the, uh, whatever it is, the spiral graph kind of graphic over top Faces. of a man's face, the the hypnotism. And mm. I'm like, man, I, I, I mean, I like these... Uh, these twenties and thirties movies, and this is a, this is a soundy. It's got audio on top of those 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 crisp black and white photographs that I know that Fritz Lang likes to shoot. Uh, yeah, I'm all in, baby. But here I am, finally watching it in 2020. It took a long, long time, mm-hmm. and I've had this DVD for several years. And in fact, uh, as I was telling Ryan uh, a couple days ago. I reached over to pick it up to watch it, and the the plastic wrap had never been cracked before. This so this was like a, all new to me, and a total blind viewing. Um, so for the for the review we're doing, we're, we'll talk about Testament of Doctor Mabuse because that's what people are here about. But uh, we're going to also hmm. be, I guess, talking about a little bit about these uh, these other Fritz Lang uh, Mabuse movies because mm-hmm. uh, th- th- he's not made not one but not two but three. Mabuse movies over the course of what f- 50 years give or take a year or two I guess yeah somewhere around there sure. uh, going all the way back with uh, Dr. Mabuse The Gambler from 1922 and mm-hmm. 1000 Eyes of Dr. Mabuse from 1968 pretty pretty cool right it just rolls off your tongue doesn't it right off the tongue Mm-hmm. So again, I had never seen these before. I didn't really even know too much about it, though. I do notice that uh, on Letterbox uh, under genre, mm-hmm. this uh, amongst other things, crime drama. It also mentions horror, and I was like, mm. "Huh, horror?" You say? I wonder what that means. Because sometimes people just throw these things in there, and like they they try to justify that, like, "Well, horror has been around so long," and like, let's try to grab any movie that has some sort of like spooky element and uh label sure. it that way and uh it's kind of a reach because there's definitely some low counts of horror in the in certain decades and certain years definitely more so in the late the late 30s where you're it's a pretty tall order to find any but mm-hmm. so i went into this not really not knowing too much about this mabuse so i i did the the smart thing i think and i mm-hmm. started off watching the gambler from 1922 <laughs> Mm. Mabuse um, the Gambler. Mabuse the Gambler. And what's the uh, runtime on that bad boy, Jer? It's like what's what's time between friends? You know? 
Maybe maybe the real movie was the uh, the Mabuses we made along the way. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Is this cinematic Mabuse? It could be. It could be. Yeah. So uh, Mabuse the Gambler available on the Criterion Channel, Jarrett. Wow. I'll see, let you, I'll let you finish. I see. I I didn't even look it up uh, because I I have I have the Fritz Lang uh, the silent films box set from Kino Lorber, oh, good old nerd. good old Mister Kino, uh-huh. and uh, so I, I had this at my fingertips, and I was like, that this is it. I'm gonna pull the trigger. I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna do it up. I'm gonna watch this Gambler, the the much beloved Gambler film, and yes, mm-hmm. RJ. This mm-hmm. is uh, clocks in. I think over four hours. I believe it's four and a half hours. Jeff. Yeah, I, th- I think it is four and a half hours because part one mm-hmm. is two and a half hours of pure nonstop silent film action, and mm-hmm. then part two is like it's just another two hours. It's uh so on the Criterion Channel. It was a it it wasn't separated by parts. It was just a a straight block, four and a half hours silent film. So uh, that's what I that's what I was on board for this week. Uh, I don't know about how Ryan, if uh, if he if he indulged in this uh, delicacy, if uh, that's how he viewed it, also. Well, if I'm quoting the the movie correctly, you gotta just eat some cocaine, you limp dick, and you'll be able to stay awake through the whole thing. I I do think that that is an actual quote from this 1922 movie because that's pre code, right, Jarrett? Yes, pre code. Yeah, yeah. pre code. Oh, yeah. So they could do oh, whatever yeah. they felt like. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I, I started off with that and uh-huh. um, got to say, I was not impressed with a gambler. Now, don't okay. get me. Don't get me wrong. I think uh, from like a production standpoint, this movie looks amazing. The mm-hmm. sets, the, the size of those sets, the uh, the cinematography, the, the technical things for 1922. This is a pretty impressive production, mm-hmm. but. I was just so <laughs> uninterested in what this was presenting to me. Sure. I what? Yeah, I <laughs> I don't know. I just was like I, I started this like at nine in the morning. I was like, damn, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna watch the gambler. And mm-hmm. like I just was like, okay. So there's this train station. There's a train, and there's a guy, and he's getting a notebook, and it's like he's going to crack the – now. oh, wait. Okay, now we're going to do some uh, stock market manipulations and uh, – Trading places style. <laughs> trading places style. That's right. Mm-hmm. Hit, yes. <laughs> Seek that, that... some disguises and some uh, – to- mm-hmm. um, yeah, I – yeah, I don't know. I I was not feeling the gambler this week, my friends. Would you have preferred The Gambler with Mark Wahlberg? Who, or perhaps uh, Twenty One, starring <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Spacey, Spacey. <laughs> or uh, uh, I don't know, or the or the Gambler? That's fine. Ryan, do you want to say anything, or do you want me to uh, go into a little bit of plot and tell you what I thought? What, what would you prefer, Bud? You want to go first, or you want me to go first? I'll just stay with the the traditional format of your guys' show. I'll let you have the floor, and I'll come in right after you. Okay, sure. Uh, So I will actually, I'm going to surprise everyone here, and I'm going to tell you, Jared, I think Mabuse the Gambler is not bad. It's not bad. Uh, Yeah. Uh, I would be lying if I didn't say that. uh, I I would be lying if I, I didn't say I fell asleep once or twice. (laughs) <laughs> during the, the filming of this movie, but I did, I did go back. I didn't like just power on, like missing an hour or anything like that. Uh, well, he is hypnotizing people a bunch of times, so I don't blame you if you got tranced into that. Yeah, a hundred percent. He's a uh, he's hypnotizing you. He's a somnambulist. The name for that was Nerm. Uh, yeah, so we got Mabuse the Gambler. Uh, you're introduced to this guy, and you're you see him. It's a very nice scene where he's kind of flicking through cards of his own disguises. And he's like, who do I want to be today? Uh, And you're introduced to him, his cocaine riddled sidekick and his uh, lackeys and uh, all these people that are under his hypnotic influence. So in the preamble, I did talk about how I don't like mind control, but this is one of those things. I know I I know I'm a walking contradiction because it's like, oh, I don't like pseudoscience and things like that. But 1922 hypnotism 
that's cool with me. I'm on board with that. No problem. Uh, so you have this guy. He's got lots of different, uh, different aliases, different costumes of what he's doing. What does he use it for? To gamble and to manipulate people into what we'll get in the later movie as the reign of crime and things like that. He's all about sending a message, Jarrett, and uh, taking down the upper crust and taking what is theirs. So we got Mabuse. He's playing, putting on costumes, just like in Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. He's wearing a disguise. He's going in. He's buying a low. He's selling high. It's the ultimate American dream. He's getting in those stonks. Uh, he's doing that. And then uh, you have a lot of cool stuff with like gambling where you see there's some poker games, shit like that. But then you also see games where it's like men in tables and there's like gambling carts flying at them and you just put chips in. I have no idea what that game is. I didn't look it up. That's fine. Uh, but you have that. Uh, you have, I think this movie has a few other cool things where, so you have some stuff like that. You have a lot of that German like expressionism stuff, that Caligari type things with the like rigidy staircase things. You would know more about that than I would share because you're art art guy. Uh, so he's he's using his thing he to gamble. He targets one big upper crust guy. It kind of goes wrong, and then people are looking for him. He's getting there's like plots of blackmail and conspiracies and prosecutors and people wanting to sue each other but no one really knows who he is because he's changing identities all the time he's either an old man a young man he he's a young priest and an old priest uh he's going back and forth he's talking to all sorts of people uh what else happens there um yeah, he's using it to do that kind of stuff. I can't remember what happens next. But you get – I actually kind of like this because you do get a lot of like George Malay stuff where it's uh, giant like mechanical men, like especially at the end of this. Uh, you get really cool imagery like that German uh, like gothic kind of stuff. Uh, he's Professor X for a while. And then you do get <laughs> a lot of cool like um, – you just got a lot of cool like filmmaking things where it's like the film overlay stuff where it's like his head kind of floating in space, like flying at people. I actually thought that was really cool. I was like, I like this. I like this old dude with huge eyebrows floating around and coming after people. So uh, as I started said at the start, maybe surprising that I would actually kind of like a four and a half hour silent film. But uh, I actually thought, is it worth watching four and a half hours? Probably not unless you're like really into this shit. But uh, for me, at least I got enough out of it that I was like, I didn't feel like it was a, a big waste of time or anything. What about you, Ryan? What's your, uh, what's your take on Mabuse, the gambler? Um, well, first I'll, uh, I'll say this initially that, um, well, if it comes to anything before, uh, you know, like that golden age of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, I really try to, I mean, even, even later on, even if you want to go into the fifties and stuff, my main goal with this kind of stuff is to try and watch it from the perspective of someone who would see that when it comes out. Sure. That's, that's, that's really what I'm trying to do with these. And uh, looking at it from that perspective, um, you know, you're looking at a German, uh, a, a, a German kind of a uh, fictional narrative era where everyone was trying to adapt like Gothic, like Nosferatu and mm -hmm. Frankenstein. I think Frankenstein was a little later, but you know, you've got vampires and all kinds of the, those the creatures like Mary Shelley, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, I think about this first and foremost, before I get into anything else is that Mabusa is uh, for not being like a creature for not being a monster. I do give a lot of credit to Fritz Lang for making a character who is pretty, uh, I wouldn't use the word iconic, but very recognizable in a, uh, in like a, uh, in a, in a protagonist sense where you, you know, he didn't become the, I mean, obviously he kept, they kept remaking it, but it didn't become mm -hmm. like this uh, superhero or like King Kong or anything super iconic like that. But for what it's worth, I think Mabusa is a cool, uh, recognizable character, especially mm -hmm. for how old this is. Um, yeah. So looking at it from that perspective, I do I do respect it to an extent, and I think uh, 
if I saw this when it came out, I would have been pretty pretty into it. I think aside from the gambling, it's a lot of just straightforward silent era narrative. Mm-hmm. But I think if you can make it all the way to that like last half an hour, that very last act, I think you would. Even even in today's time, if you were to see that last act, I think that would make up for it in some way. From the car chase to the shootout to mm-hmm. especially those mechanisms at the end, I think the yeah. uh, some of those concluding shots are some are some of the best from the silent era. The, mm-hmm. Those last couple, there's there's one shot where where Mabusa is like in front of a table and he's like he's you know he's like losing it and stuff and there's like that almost like sundial looking thing and then there's a mm-hmm. robot and then there's a, all this <laughs> like i think as far as that's concerned that's about as good as it gets visually for the silent era and you got to understand too like this is a long time ago like you know you had mentioned dr caligari you give a lot mm-hmm. of credit to that movie for being so visually iconic but for the most part a lot of these movies that come out before you know people think chaplin keaton lloyd Et cetera, et cetera, and those are all very iconic. But man, you don't have a lot prior to the mid twenties where you're looking at any sort of iconic stuff. So I gotta, I gotta give Lane credit for this to be kind of more of his. You know, he's got like the spiders and a couple other movies before this, but uh, for the most part, I think he kicked the door in pretty well with it. I mean, yeah. if you want to ask me personally, I would never, wa- I would never watch this again. Hmm. Uh, I think- <laughs> I don't think I don't, I don't think a lot of people under the age of sixty they'd be trying to. I think they'd be just trying to make themselves think they're they're more sophisticated if they actually are. Yeah, are really digging this. If I can be fair, mm-hmm. but um, no, I respect it from a. It, I, it really uh, capitalizes on that expressionist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see what other. Um, oh, I have one note here. Uh, Regardless of story, I think we can all agree that Fritz Lang was the first person to uh, put a, a cactus in an interior setting. That's for sure. He he was doing things other people only dream about, man. Yeah. That's what uh, that's Great. what I've noticed in all of these things. Like he's got cactuses someplace, some places in testamented Dr. Great. Moose. People are blowing smoke on plants. It's like he's oh, doing yeah. crazy shit, dude, all the time. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> And then I would, also, I would also say too, there was, if there was any, uh, if there's any specific line of dialogue that I think might hold some weight on this whole thing, I think at one point, I actually don't even remember. I think Mabuse said this, but somebody said, uh, someone asked him about expressionism, and then he, he said, Express, expressionism is just playing about. Everything's just playing about these days, so. I think that kind of that kind of touches on a lot of their that those directors' approaches to trying to be visually visionary and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean a lot of it was I mean because they they're shooting black and white, so they have they have to create these like visuals that play to the screen. That's why like mm-hmm. you have like that like stark makeup because it's yeah. not because it's like oh people are like pale ghouls and vamps. It's like no, it's because um, it's like this theatrical oh. tradition, and like you have to like make sure so that people's faces show up. And then like when you start seeing those movies that like there are people who are still trying to do that makeup like five years after like we've had these advances and technology starts looking really weird because <laughs> people shouldn't look like that. Um, yeah. It's like it's, you, like me. That's people why I shouldn't look like that. That's, 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 why I'm, that's why I'm in podcast form only. No, well, no video. You let our appearances slide on uh, one episode. So in, in oh. a, one, in, in one, well, one off. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, yeah, uh, to go to Ryan's thing, talking about like, kind of like the, uh, the M- Mabuse is like a a villain, I guess, because like yeah, like there's obviously the characters that this is a rift on too, like kind of like from around that same like ten year window in like uh, literature, like there's like Fu Manchu uh, mm. and I and it's particularly a uh, Phantomos, uh, mm-hmm. the, the French uh, master criminal, and there's yeah. also um, was it uh, Sven Gali. Which is like he was the yeah. he was the the master hypnotist. Yeah. Uh, it's like yeah, this idea is like it's like it's like this nebula of uh, villains of these arch villains and like super criminals, and they always have like a detective that that they're toying with, and they're always mm-hmm. are getting the upper hand on. And like I guess like uh, in some ways you think that Mabuse 
would maybe in like a short time like lend itself more to like uh the serial where you'd have mm-hmm. like this like super villain like a moriarty even too like predating these guys as well um who like t- is always like being chased or a pink panther rj sure so phantom moose when i when you said that phantom well, moose think, phantom moose phantom moose uh i thought you said phantom ass uh, and I was just like, is that the sequel to that famed movie you were working on years ago? Uh, rape ghost. No, that's a deep cut no, no. for people, that's, but that, that's uh, a, pre- that's a prequel. That's a prequel. Oh, phantom mass is the prequel. Yeah. Damn dude. Yeah. Super villain stuff. We'll talk about that in Testament, but, uh, I mean, he is the Joker, you know, and we'll, we'll get there too. Right. Sure. <laughs> we'll get there. Well, we'll we can get, get right. We, we get there right now. So this, this really sure. great movie that nobody wants to watch more than once. So. <laughs> <That's>... uh, <laughs> I'm a boost the gambler. No. So here's the thing. I never said, I never wanted wait, to say Wait, that wait, wait. Is that, is that true? Is that what, well, no, but you I wouldn't like... watch it again either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, just, it's it's just too much of an investment. I, like I said, I would never watch it again. I'd never tell anyone else to watch it. There are things that I like about it. So it's like if you were gonna do a Mabuse run, Mabuse. Yeah, which we've done now. Which we've done now. Yeah, it's like I actually do think it's the right way to go because, uh, as Ryan even pointed out, I I was actually kind of surprised by the ending. I was like, I was like, God damn, they're having a shootout. I was like, I wasn't expecting that in this 2020 <laughs> silent film. That's and cool. For, for what the times were, it's a pretty pretty. A uh, legit one, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So I was I wasn't expecting that ending at all. And then even like the uh, blind like uh, factory sweatshop workers and like them getting put in asylums. I was like, God damn. So yeah, I don't think it's like this great movie or anything. But I actually did get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Yes, I did fall asleep a couple times. I nodded <laughs> off, but uh, uh, I'd, I'd say on the whole, there there there's some stuff to enjoy there. So I don't think it's like yeah. a complete piece of shit or nothing like that the, the thing that really jumps out at me in this uh thinking about it right now is like the the top hats because <laughs> there's oh, like sure. the scenes like during like the stock market like where you just like these oceans of hats and you're like you just you just don't yeah. see that anymore yeah do you ever wear hats Jarrett? uh only my Baylog auction hat what that sounds like a good hat i think oliver uh beg your pardon well you'll see one day I won't. You won't. I, I How do does not, your head look I, I, in hats? I, I don't know what you actually said. Oh. How does your head look in hats? Uh, strange. Can we get a picture of that for the Instagram, or at least for Ryan, uh, friend of the sh- new friend of the show, Ryan Norris, to send him a picture <laughs> of your head in hats, just so he knows? Yeah, from the back. Sure. Because he, he definitely knows what I look like. He does now. I guess. In- so why don't you tell me about the testament of Dr. Mabuse? Well, hey. RJ, since you asked so nicely, sure. uh, this I felt uh, things turned around for me and Mabuse. Okay. Um, this just seems to be a, a more succinct version and with sound. And, oh, and, on, and, and, on to- and so on top of this testament of Mabuse, we also have a somewhat of a sequel to another Fritz Lang movie that we've talked about on this very podcast uh, with yeah. M, as we have the return of Loman, uh, good old good old commissioner, sometimes detective Loman, my man, who who uh, appears once mm-hmm. more uh, to uh, solve crime. This mm-hmm. one uh, having a different vibe on the whole, it has a bit more of a pulpy flavor than uh, than your M. But there's dealings with underworlds and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. an investigation of like how is this even possible? So things pick up. Um, old uh, that old evil hypnotist uh, Mubuse, mm-hmm. he's down and out. He's uh, he went into a trance and he just like handwrites over and over and over again inside an insane an insane asylum. Sure. And uh, but these these eventually these notes they've started to make sense and they start translating these things and it's like wait a minute he's laying out these great crimes and then these crimes are being executed to a t how can this be what what's the goings ons here mm-hmm. um so the movie opens up with this like r- like super well done like just basic storytelling um yeah. Of a of a man who's mm-hmm. like uh, who's infiltrated uh, this warehouse to gather information on this like I guess criminal network where that's like they're kind of I can't remember what the warehouse is for 
exactly mm-hmm. is it a wall if it's like the warehouse yeah just for hanging out dude yeah because there's like this whole thing about like counterfeiting that's yeah. happening and mm-hmm. like th- this detective he's like kind of like trying to prove himself because he's kind of an embarrassment mm-hmm. but like it's just like so well staged him hiding him being spotted them like thinking about what they're going to do but then they go no no we've got this and then they like leave and the tension is palatable the use of sound uh because it's very minimal there's no like constant music playing which is one of the drawbacks i find with silent films sometimes for me is the the canned silent music that they use uh in silent films mm-hmm. i find just like really if it, it, it it's not necessary because here we have a movie that is a a soundy, but it's using minimal. Mu- it uses almost like very little music, and just lets mm-hmm. the silence tell the story as well. So that was like that was uh, Wait, very pleasant. <laughs> you're telling me four hours of xylophones doesn't <laughs> exponentially enhance your experience? I I think I might be suggesting that. Yes, <laughs> I find that a little suspect. Also, yeah. I uh, I mean I'm all about xylophones. You know, Jer. <laughs> and and what's that one yeah. thing? A theremin. Well, there's no. I don't think there's any theremin in here. Oh yeah, yeah. But it but would be cool though. It would be cool. Make it spooky. Be spooky. Yeah, um, you know, you know, Fritz Lang's buddies playing it on skeleton bones or whatever. Hundred percent. He was a spooky ass <laughs> dude. His name was Fritz. He knows. Yeah. What's that. G had an eye patch, man. Damn. Cool dude. Or I think he just, 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 I think he just had a monocle. I don't think he. Uh, he no, I think he, he did have an eye patch because I watched uh, Mabuse in Mind, and they showed an eye patch in guy quite did a bit. He? Okay, because it off. Okay, because I always think of like uh, Nicholas Ray as like one of the uh, the eye, mm. one, part of the eye patch gang. But uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, this dude wore an eye patch. Okay, it could have been cor- to correct a lazy eye or something because he had both eyes. But like you know how that you used to do that was like eye patch to correct a lazy eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, he got he got hurt in World War One. I. I think. Oh shit. Yeah. Tom York style. Eye patch. Fritz Lang eye patch. Oh yeah, he, there he is, rocking yeah, the eye patch. He's part of the club. He is. He's in there. Him, Tom York. How uh, did Fritz Lang lose his eye? The war apparently is what Ryan says. The war. Uh, let's see here. What are the? What is this? There's like one answer. I think he still had his eye. I, I think it was just fucked up. Right. What is? Right? This? No one's really telling me what's right, going boys? on with his eye. The, that photo was taken in 1916. Though strange, why he's wearing an eye patch on only one of his eyes. <laughs> I believe he was what fully. I believe he was fully blind in the eye with the patch on it, though he could still see a little in his other eye. Needless to say, though, he had extremely poor eyesight in his later years until his death in 76. Well, this is just like, this is off uh, good old Quora.com. And it has now just muddied the waters even more Mm -hmm. for me. Thanks, Internet. At least uh, um, Wikipedia says... um, uh, Lang returned to Vienna and volunteered for military service in the... Austrian army and fought in Russia and Romania where he was wounded three times while recovering from the, his injuries and shell shock. Uh, he wrote scenarios for his films. Uh, oh, shit. Star is, is this guy, so he, not mm-hmm. only, so he is wearing an eye patch and a monocle <laughs> and sometimes glasses. Why not do it all, Jared? Oh, my, my goodness. Well, <laughs> so b- back to Testament of Dr. Mabuse. So uh-huh. anyway, this guy, he stealthily leaves the the warehouse. And then mm-hmm. uh, there's a couple of dudes just waiting for him at the end of the street. And what do they do? Well, they take a barrel and they send that fucker down the street and it explodes. DK Real... style. That's yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So well, this is a, a rollicking start. Sure. So w- this guy, he gets kind of uh, shuffled away, uh, hidden away, because uh, mm-hmm. he's being hunted by these goons who uh, need to conceal their counterfeiting operations and other like underworldly operations. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was like a, you know a phone call desperately made to uh, Commissioner Lowman, who he just wants to go to go catch a show. You know, he he's uh, had enough of this. He's not that the the valiant police officer uh, that you would expect from like this period of time. He's kind of like ah. Uh, you know, slow to get up. Don't answer that phone. I'm almost done. It's more of a realistic depiction, I guess, of a, an aged uh, policeman. 
Mm. But mm-hmm. soon enough, he's he's drawn into this world of uh, I don't know sex. Sex is there, is there is that the right thing to describe Mabuse in his testament, RJ? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Uh, and then we're introduced to a couple. What, what kind? Uh, a couple Two of them? love. A, uh, a young man and a young woman. Sure. And and there are scenes with them. <laughs> There's one scene though. I'm pretty damn sure uh, Tarantino uses in Inglorious Bastards. Uh, mm-hmm. where, there's like it's like so similar like the way they're even sitting in the booth and the kind of like awkward framing of it because they couldn't get up closer against the wall and or talking about like hot cream and I was like is this not like the exact same bit from Glorious Bastards and I didn't follow up on it I'm sure someone's wrote a like like annotations Essay. of it about like oh here's like just things that Tarantino threw in just because and I'm like well I I feel like it, it's probably there because it seems way too familiar but maybe mm-hmm. I'm wrong. Can really um, count on a chick walking out before she even drinks like three sips of a freaking milkshake. Mm. Well, those milkshakes are thick in Germany, man. Let me tell you, I've never Fair. been, but I've heard a I lot know. of stories. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does this like fit into your RJ, your problem of like people throwing away food unnecessarily? Well, I mean, is that not a problem of yours? You are you, are you saying you're pro waste dude? Yeah. Yeah. Pro waste? Well, I'm sure that uh, in the art of making film, uh, a lot of food gets wasted in scenes. I think they should just invite a bunch of like homeless people to come in and clean up all that food. Would you eat that food that was on the table in Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Uh, After, like, I mean, it's, where, where it's like a hundred, a hundred and twenty <laughs> degrees. I, I had a friend mates. one time eat mm. food off of uh, left food in the mall food court one time. Really? Wow. Yeah, we're not really friends anymore. You you call it quits there, huh? Yeah, you know, you know. Um. So anyway, yeah. yeah uh, sure. the, the, there's like the comings and goings of uh-huh. this whole plot. It's like it's fairly convoluted uh, sure. as far as like how it draws it all together, and they, everybody shows up at the exact same time at the end. Mm-hmm. But for me, the biggest takeaway for for me with this Mabuse that really like kind of explained this horror hashtag genre thing was when we get to the astral projection of Dr. Mabuse and you get the whole gimmick of like, how is Mabuse doing the things that he's doing? He's in a coma. It's like, well, not when you can cast your mind into another person, take them over and have them do your, your activities on your behalf. And uh, we get some, some imagery that is just like, it's so good. And you're just like, man, that David Lynch, what a what a plagiarist! He just he's been milking this mabuse all this all this time. No one no one talks enough about it because between those scenes of the astral projection of like that crazy makeup with the eyes and that forehead and just him sitting around in rooms floating around behind people, and uh, you get to that curtained room where like people are like coming into this room. Uh, it is something straight out of Twin, Twin Peaks. Uh, you can just imagine uh, evil Dale Cooper behind that curtain or uh, David Bowie in his steam machine uh, d- dictating orders. It's all there. I, uh, and there's even the audio buzzing of whenever they're, they're shifting to like Mabuse mode with the astral stuff. And there's this like, like a distortion on the audio track, which that's got to be like, that is so ahead of its time. And so influential. Like I, I don't know. Maybe I need to like do a little bit more research on this. I'm not going to. But I feel like this is like Shameful. this. This changes everything. And eventually, like it's everywhere now. Like every time anything spooky happens, there's audio distortion. In this, I feel like it's pretty like uh, it's, it's so typified here. I don't know. There's probably examples of it before, but mm-hmm. I feel like this is maybe like the biggest example of it. And I feel feel like probably most people saw this. Like there's experimental film uh, playing with audio, and whatnot. But here it's like you have the the spooky image, and you have uh, astral projections, and you have this mm-hmm. electrical distortion. I mean, that's just that's the Black Lodge right there. I mean, that's pretty big if true. I don't know. I don't think David Lynch has ever seen a TV or show or movie ever. That's probably that's that's probably true. He does it all from memory. Yeah, yeah I don't like think he's ne- never even been awake. No, yeah. that dude's never been awake. I think it's all like Neil Young style. He just he just knows what to do. He makes movies. He doesn't watch the movies he makes, Jared. 
Not at all, Jarrett. Not at Jarrett. all. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think this movie sets a lot of trends. You have uh, that, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the very obvious connection that um, people make uh, to the Dark Knight's Joker, because Chris Nolan himself uh, credits Dr. Mabuse as one of his favorite films and something that he he kind of attributes to his Joker character about, you know, it's about the reign of crime, Jared. It's not about the money, <laughs> which I mean, like I knew that going in and then I watched it and I was like, I get it. I was like, I see, I see why he like pulled from this stuff. Cause he's just like, just evil dude. He's like, let's poison the reservoir. Let's do it. He's like, let's blow up this factory. It'll kill a bunch of people. He's like, who cares? But his astral projection plane is I love when his like his brain is out and his eyeballs yeah. are like super huge. Oh, he oh, looks yeah. so cool. It's so wicked. I like it a lot. Yeah, that is like yeah, that's like holy shit. This is worth mm-hmm. it right here. Just yep. this just this footage. <laughs> I uh yeah, I think that alone is really good. I also actually really like the plot of this one where it's like so coming off of Mabuse the Gambler, and you see how he's this like hypnotist and he used it for like counterfeiting, gambling, and like petty crime stuff but like not exactly up to like he does a little extortion but this one is just full-on kind of villainous bad guy i think and i like i i actually do really like the idea of him being like immortal because he can like they do body transfer stuff but it's also it's like the cult of mabuse that'd be a sick movie right now that christopher nolan could make cult of mabuse uh and like the idea it's just like his batman movies Jared. it's like (laughs) a legend is more than a person itself because it can live forever just like mabuse do you see what i mean who who uh is also a an evil hypnotist an evil hypnotist just like scarecrow jerry <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so i uh i actually ha- really happy happy like... what is it the 15th anniversary of uh, yes, batman begins this yes, past week wow yes it is i'm glad you noticed i got i'm glad you remembered but i actually really like the plot of testament of dr mabuse because it it has like those themes uh and there's some stuff like you said like the uh the couple, you're not really like you're like ah eh, whatever. And well, like even like, his well, henchmen, you're kind of like not such well, a, whatever. Because he's, he's not such a bad goon, right? Well, you're introduced to him in the spot where he's the reluctant goon. He's like, yeah. I don't really want to do this, and they're like, he, Well, you got a bud. He, he's a goon with a heart of gold, and then he's yeah. like, but he's got. Then of course he's got this lily now, and he's mm. like, Well, maybe maybe we should inform. And it's like, Well, you're gonna get informed, and you're gonna get picked up, and uh, you're gonna get blown up in this room. Hell yeah, man. But that's why, like, and that's what I mean, like, so I don't, the couple, I don't find their story that interesting, but what's going on with Mabuse and his plans is wicked. The police commissioner guy, Commissioner Gordon, proto Commissioner Gordon, I think he's awesome, even when he's blowing, like, smoke on plants. <laughs> and I, I do like the ending with the chase, and it, it kind of reminds me of the uh, the road from uh, Extro. You ever seen Extro, Ryan, the alien film? No, no. I, I, you might have seen you might have seen the gifts of it. The gifts are pretty yeah. sweet. Is it called Extro? Uh, like X T R O. Yeah, X T R O Extro. The the highway at the end of Testament of Mabuse is just like Extro. I think so. Uh, well, I I think there's this movie influenced things we're not even thinking about. Well, hell, so, there's even like lost like uh the the image of like a car driving down a highway road and with only sure. headlights lighting things. Uh, I mean. That's some that's some David Lynch right there too. Oh, you checking out Extra? Oh yeah. <laughs> do you, do you think it looks like the ending of Testament of Doctor Mabuse? Maybe. Well, I can't say much off the poster, but the poster's got me pretty hooked. <laughs> yeah, man, Extra Extra is a cool movie. I think you should definitely check it out. Just, uh, I mean, it's not a good movie, but it's a cool movie. It's very. It's got at least two incredibly oh, yeah. memorable moments. By Harry Bromley Davenport, Jarrett. You remember yeah. him, right? For Britain's own. Yeah. So anyways, I uh, I think that's all cool. But uh, I would love to hear what uh, our new friend, uh, Ryan uh, Norris, thinks of uh, Testament of Dr. Mabuse. Unless you had more stuff to say, Jarrett. But I don't nah, really care nah. about your opinion. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. How about it, Ryan? How, how, how did you like this Testament? Well, uh, well I'm going to... I guess for the YouTube viewers, they're not going to maybe have heard this the first half of the segment, but I, I'm going to maybe mildly contradict myself uh, by saying that if there is, we were talking about context earlier in the video, 
there's going to be a couple movies where where context really makes a difference mm -hmm. in in its in its uh, impact. I think this is one of them. Um, before I get, to, I guess, uh, just to give some extra uh, backstory on this, this is a movie that uh, this is the last movie Fritz Lang made in Germany before he split because uh, the Nazi <laughs> regime took over, and. Um, our, our, our guys Hitler and and and, and etc. Uh, I believe we're pretty pretty big fans of Fritz Lang. Mm. Uh, I know they thought Metropolis was really good, and I think uh, what was the guy's name again? Goebbel? Ge Ge Goebbels. 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 Yeah, he. They address him in uh, Mabuse in Mind because they talk about how he was just like, we can't let this movie get out because people will know that uh, they can do this. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So um, Fritz Lang kind of a lot of his uh, a lot of the like the the indirect sentiment behind a lot of his stuff was very anti-fascist, especially uh, if you see Testament of Doctrine and Abuse after this, you'll know exactly like uh, where he's coming from in terms of uh, mind control and all that kind of stuff. But um, they actually tried to recruit him to be part of a Nazi regime uh, to make you know just utterly ridiculous propaganda from. Yeah. stuff like that and mm -hmm. and uh i think initially he said oh yeah of course guys no problem and then he just had his fingers <laughs> crossed behind him and split right off to i think france yeah. uh, and then eventually america but um with that in mind if there's yeah like i mentioned if there's gonna be a movie where context matters i think weighing that into this story adds a lot to it um mm -hmm. but aside from that a story in itself just to inspire a guy like Christian Nolan, I think this is this is probably I think in terms of film buffs, a lot of them are probably familiar with this movie. But I think this movie flies over a lot of people's heads when it comes to um, memorable movies, especially from the '30s, let alone early sound pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at it from Fritz Lang following up the most controversial of the most controversial movies ever made to go from a child murderer to a supernatural crime movie with ghosts in it that's a pretty dope flip i gotta say it's almost <laughs> like um it's like it almost kind of reminds me of how stanley kubrick would just do ridiculous 180 flips between each movie going you know like Lolita to Doctor Strange Love to 2001 to Clockwork Orange to Barry Lyndon to to Shining. It's just back and yeah. back and forth. And that's pretty much what Fritz Lang, I'd say, has easily one of the most impressive like 10 year stretches. Of I mean, he is one of the great directors ever. But looking at a 10 year stretch, going from I mean, The Gambler is one thing, but um, I think his most underrated movie is probably uh, The Nibelungs was a like a, a kind of more like um what would you want to call it like fantasy not really knights but a little more medieval style uh movie he made a couple of those it has probably people will be uh, really uh, familiar with it with the famous uh fight against the dragon um mm -hmm. but he went you know he went from that to freaking uh metropolis and then i think you know he made a couple in between like spies and uh woman on the moon you know those are like those aren't you know those are cool for what they're worth but to go from metropolis to m to this movie is just pretty damn ballsy and impressive and just bouncing off of that i'd say that this movie is if there's going to be movies that like you know how i mentioned uh the gambler i would never watch again after seeing it i think a lot of people uh after seeing this would if there's going to be a few movies that anyone would ever want to revisit from the 30s, it'd be something like this. Because there, uh, I think, I think beyond like substance in movies, uh, just what makes a movie really quality is just making uh, like memorable shots and sequences, almost kind of like uh, you know, like an abuse the fucking gambler, uh, like a deck of cards, right? I almost feel like shots in a movie are like a deck of cards, and when you have like a good deck of cards, or. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have like a good, uh, good hand of cards, you know, if you have like a flush, that's almost like a good sequence. And I think this movie just has a handful of really good 
sequences uh, beyond just people talking and giving exposition standing around a desk. I mean, obviously there is that, and there's stuff like that to this day, but mm-hmm. but uh, there's a lot of really memorable stuff. Uh, you had mentioned the, the opening scene with the oscillating machinery. That's very memorable. The camera movement in that's memorable. And I would mm-hmm. say um, even I think what falls, like a piano or a crate almost falls on one of the guys at the beginning. That's a really good hook into the story. That's some really good visual. And then you got the... Um, Another really memorable scene with with a like impeccable use of sound, or well, more like lack of sound, is uh, the um, the shooting in the the traffic stop. Right. That's yeah. a that's a really incredible scene because you got a traffic stop where a bunch of people are honking their horns, and then you got a guy that uh, takes out somebody uh, with a pistol, and um, you hear everything but the gunshot sound and then that visual of all the cars driving off and the one dead guy just sitting there in the middle of the street. That is a very, very well, uh, well done shot. Were you aware that like, I guess like Lang, uh, prefer to use like actual guns, (laughs) like during like these scenes. Uh, no, no. Yeah, apparently, yeah, no, this is apparently the thing. So, yeah, Lang often used real weapons. In the opening scene during a power outage, a stunt actor did the gunplay. Cinematographer Fritz Arno Wagner stated that he spent most of the production in a state of panic due to the way Lang would endanger his crew. Uh, the film is generally filmed in a realistic style, with the exception of Mabuse's uh, ghostly appearances throughout the film. Lang admitted later in the interviews that if he could redo the film, he would not have included these supernatural scenes. See, Fritz, yeah. come on, bud. <laughs> he had a good. He had a good. See, these these are these are the, the maybe these are the flaws. These are the the cracks in the Fritz Lang uh, facade of being the, one of the great directors. He's questioning the the go, ghostly Mabuse. He's he's using real guns, endangering the crew. I mean, this, what's, what's, what's what's happening here with this man? When when do you think the Fritz is canceled party uh, is going to happen? <laughs> after after this goes live. Oh okay, fair enough. But yeah, sorry, oh, sorry, Ryan. You were saying so. Yeah, you're talking oh, about that's that particular scene and the, the that sound editing. That scene's really good, mm-hmm. um, especially being early talkie movie. The use of sound is again. I mean, you guys mentioned M. Uh, he just went right back to work with Testament uh, as far as his uh, sound innovation, and then just. Um, what else was I got? A one more note here. Uh, oh yeah, the ensemble. This is a very unconventional ensemble in terms of narratives, and uh, I mean, Doctor Mabuse is in the title, but uh, he isn't in much of it. And you got a very, uh, you got a a lot of parallel storylines. Well, not necessarily storylines. It's all the kind of similar storyline, but you got a lot of characters jumping around doing different things. And uh, I think that holds a lot of merit because I don't think, you know, they're they're definitely not like fully three dimensional fleshed out characters. But for what it's worth in the 30s, they have a lot of energy. And I think they keep yeah. the, the, the pacing of the story going really. And this is a really fast paced story, I would say, in, mm-hmm. in comparison to other movies from this era. Also, um, what else I can say? Um, I know I have one more here. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Yeah, you mentioned the car. I mean, that's a pretty damn good car chase for what it's worth. Yeah. And then I also, um, I watched one guy, I know you guys probably aren't going to, uh, and I don't necessarily agree with it that much either, but I watched one guy. He actually made a uh, comparison to Citizen Kane with this movie okay. because it's hmm. a bunch of people trying to uh, trace together recollections of somebody else, like this notorious entity. Okay. So I guess not necessarily stylistically, it's not that different, but I could almost see, uh, considering it's like within 10 years of Citizen Kane coming out, I wouldn't doubt Orson Welles maybe saw this and subconsciously had some sort of influence on him uh, piecing together that narrative. Yeah, maybe. I, I've never uh, never read about that. That's pretty cool. Wasn't yeah, that's speculation, that. I guess. Yeah. When uh, talking about Goebbels again, too, the other thing that uh, another link back to Inglorious Bastards is uh, oh. Ge- Goebbels is a character in Inglorious Bastards. Cause it... Is that Mike <laughs> Myers? Yeah, with Shoshana. It's like, yeah, they actually meet. Mm. But I'm like, oh, there's something a little bit there. It's like, I think Quentin Tarantino watches movies sometimes. I, I think. I don't think he's ever seen a movie either, dude. 
Okay. That's <laughs> true. He's, he's, he only he's reads, making he, shit up. He reads about them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 So, uh, that, yeah. so do we all like this testament? So yeah, I like it. I think it's good. It? Good. Yeah, for sure. Is it because oh. is, is it because it's like uh, Christopher Nolan movies, RJ? Uh, exclusively because it's about Chris. Oh, it's it's about Christopher. This is a prequel about Christopher Nolan. So uh, that's pretty cool, right, Bud? Yeah. Right, Bud. What about you, uh, Ryan? Sorry, what was that? Like in regards to Nolan? Or no, no I just uh, like no, just uh, in you, general. Yeah. Do you like yeah. the? It, you you like this movie? So like, how, how do you oh. feel in comparison oh, yeah. to? Uh, uh, gambler, so you'd watch it again. Which that's, I think, a positive thing. Um. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you have uh, uh, ten years in film in that era of film did a, made a big difference as far as storytelling was concerned. I think that has a lot to do with it. But like I said, if you go back to, um, if I could compare uh, the Gambler to another movie from that era, like obviously, um, I think what you guys have talked about Haxen already, right? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to stuff like Haxon or, uh, you know, The Kid or Caligari or those those early 20s movies, I mean, obviously those all have a lot more uh, memorable things to offer than Mabuse, The Gambler. But um, this one, I think, just has, uh, I'd say about every 15, every 15 minutes or so, you're, you're given a pretty memorable scene. Uh, as far as early talkie films are concerned, which is way more that you can ask for in comparison to a lot of stuff in that era. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I, know, I think I know what you're saying, man. Like, uh, there's a lot of striking things. Whereas, like Mabuse the Gambler, I actually thought it had a lot of striking scenes, but there's also two and a quarter, two hours and a quarter that is just like the actual cards of the text, and it. It's like, yeah, I, I, th- I know this movie is 98 years old, so it's like I, I can give it a little slack on that. But at the same time, my enjoyment in 2020, in the current age, COVID, yeah, I don't know what I get out of it. But uh, yeah, yeah, like Testament of Dr. Mabusa, I, I actually liked quite a bit. What about you, Jared? Did you ever say? Yeah. No, like yeah. Yeah, this, um, I mean, I think that there is, it's this from a story point of view, it's kind of a, I don't know. A, it's a movie. It's uh, there isn't like well, a lot what, of like. What it's it's like. a movie. It's it's a movie. Like there's like a you know it's very like formulaic for I think even for the time. There, it's like but there obviously there's these visual cues that are like amazing and there's like there's definitely a uh, Fritz Lang's um, technical uh, experiments. Like there's he's a he's reapplying a lot of like the same sort of shots and like the, that he figured out with the police procedural of M and he's doing them again. In Testament, like there's the shots of the city. He keeps going back to those maps of the city, uh, the kind of like close ups on evidence, like all those things I kind of remember. I kind of like those like boring details that like nobody loves and obsesses about uh, with M, unless you start like you're on a weird screen capper like me. Uh, there's a lot of those. They kind of repeat themselves, but it's because he's like using, he's relearning and reusing yeah. that language. And then I guess with like supernatural Mabuse, I mean, he's kind of like drawing on this like silent film, phantasmagorical sort of images. And, but it looks like it's so striking because you're not expecting it because it's grounded in this otherwise realistic setting. And I think like Fritz Lang thinks that he'd take that out and he, like, he's a, he's an idiot. <laughs> like, that's just crazy. It's like, how mm-hmm. could you, how would you, why would you throw that away? But I guess like it's just tonally he has a, a weird problem with it, I guess. But so it goes. Um, yeah, just to go on with what you're saying, um, there's some really dope uh, forensic moments in this too. Uh, the one that stands out to me a lot was the uh, writing in the glass. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. With the flip, like, when it, with the flip around in the mirror and the uh, yeah, that that was a uh, yeah. Pretty, I mean, to this day, that would be that would be in an episode of uh, whatever Law and Order. You can see that yeah <laughs> yeah the i guess that's like kind of like the thing too is like the procedural of uh like it's just become so ingrained and like this is like one of those like early examples of like finding like how do you build up suspense and you have these unsolved these quote unsolvable mysteries or puzzles that 
then they get revealed and it's like, well, there's a whole like, I mean, mystery writers, uh, you know, screenwriters, they like think about these ideas of like, how do you draw an audience along and like build up to that reveal and actually give people content. Uh, this would be an example of that. Like, Hey, how do you like create these ideas? And I mean, silent film serials, like, uh, like Phantom Moss stuff. It's all about that. It's like all these big builds. And eventually it's like, Oh, you find out there's like secret corridors behind that wall. Um, mm. and you get the same thing with the, the mystery room with the curtain in this, where like the goons all line up, which are all scenes I actually really enjoyed. I actually, I, one thing we haven't talked about too much, uh, uh, for the performances in this, I love the goons cause they're very like, mm. they're kind of going along with this. Like, and you're like, well, this, this is kind of a weird situation to find ourselves in, but we're mm. going to like talk to the curtain and there's a man on the other side. And then eventually when the, um, the Definitely. couple gets dropped off there, they, uh, they go, aha. And they find out it's like a cutout and like the, like, uh, it's all pre recorded dialogue, which is like mm. fascinating. And then they're like, oh shit. We're, and then you hear the ticking of this bomb then they're trying to find a way out. That stuff is like very like, it's a throwback uh, to like those like 15, 1915s uh, serials uh, mm-hmm. that were happening uh, or in the 15s and 20s and stuff like that. Or in, yeah, 1910s, 1920s. And it's just playing out those things. And I don't know, they're, they're enjoyable tropes, but sure yeah, they are. Sure they are. <laughs> but what, what happens in what? 27 years later, when uh, Fritz Lang revisits Mabuse, his, his Mabuse, this Mabuse dude, I would, I would Whoa. use, the, I would use the visits kind of lightly. Visits, yeah, like I, I don't know about you boys, but uh, I thought uh, this thing was the most Mabuse list of the Mabuses. Yeah, well, I mean, there's certainly that psychic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's that guy. And it's like, I, I know I was just saying that in Testament. I like the idea that he lives forever. But it's like, um, yeah, I mean, Mabuse is not around anymore. Jared? Well, what about, his thousand, what about his thousand eyes? I don't know. I, I think I counted two or four. Okay. <laughs> and, an I, me and, about, and, and an eye patch? And an eye patch. Why don't you tell me about the thousand eyes of Mabuse? I don't know, man. I I this slid right off my eyes. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you about Thousand Eyes of Mabuse. Okay, tell me about the Thousand Eyes of Dr. Right. Mabuse. Because I I thought this was uh I mean, so just to be clear to people, I'm I'm not uh ignorant of Fritz Lang. I've actually seen the vast majority of Fritz Lang's American movies after he left uh Germany. I've I've right. watched like dozens of fritz lang movies but uh, this is a bit of a jump up from his last few movies and this is like him going back to europe this west german slash french slash italian international production uh where this man is uh kind of in his his twilight in production i think he makes like one or two more movies after this and then uh he calls it quits sure and it feels like it sure but RJ, That's tell maybe. tell tell us about the thousand eyes of Doctor Mabuse. Thousand eyes, Doctor Mabuse, Jarrett. You got this American guy. He's this tycoon, real estate oil, or he is just a individually, personally wealthy man. He is in a hotel room. The hotel manager is like, "Yo, dude, want to creep on this babe? I got this two way <laughs> mirror into her room." And he says, "This is disgusting. I will take this room immediately." And then you go. Oh, weird. Uh, girlfriend tries to kill herself. He goes, and this happens before, actually. She goes to kill herself, and he's just like, listen, baby. Uh, or the cops try to talk her down, and they're like, listen, honey, this is going to be a huge scandal. You don't want that, right? Don't kill yourself. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make everyone's day bad. Don't do it. He comes out, and he's like, listen, baby. If you kill yourself, or if you jump, you might not die right away. You could be like struggling for hours. That would suck. <laughs> so he grabs her, he pulls her in. They're just like, ooh, man, we love each other. You get some henchmen on the side. You get this insurance salesman who is seemingly <laughs> everywhere. And then you get a police officer who is above the law. He forces himself into a lot of situations. And I got a couple screen caps where the lady goes, this is my personal life. And he said, honey, when the police are involved, you got no personal life oh, and you go, man. whoa, uh, <laughs> topical. hashtag black lives matter, baby. 
Very topical. So you got this in 1960, policeman. no less. 1960. He's there. He, uh, it's this big police guy. He, um, he like, I guess he's kind of supposed to be like the detective in the last one, but he's not. But like trying to fill that looks pretty of, damn pretty close. If you he's squint. pretty close, but he doesn't smoke his cigars with a, uh, a tip, and I think that's the big giveaway. Uh, so he's trying to figure things out, and then eventually it does come back to this thing again. It's like you know. 30 some years ago there was this mabuse guy maybe it's him you know what i mean guys uh and then like mabuse isn't in this very very much it's mostly just this like tycoon guy and this lady and then you get another you get a couple doctors a couple detectives they're all trying to like figure stuff out and then there's a secret hideout. There are secret plans for the reign of crime and terror. And they want to unleash terror on people again. And uh, <laughs> it's, like, I mean, it's like Bane. It is like Bane. These movies are, these are all, this is just the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, so this one, I thought Thousand Eyes was okay, but uh, it's got, it's got the least bit of Mabuse. And then it also like, I was kind of like, I don't even think this, needs to be a Mabuse movie movie it's just a thing so I don't know I thought it was fine like as a movie itself I thought it was fine but in terms of these Mabuse ones I like I just I just briefly went to their page now to pull up the who hates and I see people are saying it's like this is the best Mabuse and I'm like what the the fuck I'm like what are they talking about so uh, I think my rating is testament and then Gambler, and then 1,000 Eyes. But uh, that's just me personally. I don't know if Ryan has a different rub on these things, or maybe I got the plot wrong, or if Ryan wants to jump in and just kind of give his uh, two cents on 1,000 Eyes. This I is a transcendent fun. cinematic experience that goes beyond... Uh, no, yeah, I'm right there with you, bro. Um, yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, if but, you uh, liked it, that'd be fine, too. I, w- I wouldn't hold it against you, man. Here, here, I'll... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, oh, how very kind way. of you, RJ. Do you guys, do you guys, do you guys watch sports at all? I do. Jared doesn't. Jared doesn't know what a sport <laughs> is, but I, I watch them. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, you know how you got your uh, kind of Hall of Fame like players. Sure. And uh, they might, they might be very dedicated to a team for a long time, and sure. then they have, like you mentioned, they got their twilight years, right? Mm-hmm. And like. Uh, First thing comes to mind, maybe be like uh, like Shaquille O'Neal, right? You know, he does great in the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Three times he goes, to the heat. goes to the Heat, kicks some more ass on the Heat, mm-hmm. and but then it was a bit of a it was a bit of a ring chase a while for a good old Shaq, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you got Phoenix. Oh, I think he might have yeah had a decent year in Phoenix, but you got like Boston and Cleveland, right? right. Where it's really just kind of a uh, it's a bit of a uh, a salute. It's a bit of a uh, it's a bit of an exit exit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this is that's what this movie is. This is just Shaq on the Celtics. Not necessarily. <laughs> I don't think Fritz Lang's trying to chase a ring mm-hmm. or anything. He's not going for Oscars, but just feels like a bit of a his knees his knees aren't 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 taking aren't taking the hits as well. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Step I, uh, extra weight on him, less muscle. <laughs> I uh, I I think your analogy is perfect, and I think when you do make your letterbox account, your review of Thousand Eyes can just be this is like Shaq on the Celtics. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I think people <laughs> around the world will understand what you're saying. So uh, yeah, I want to with that. Or to put it another way, for Jarrett, because he's watching The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. This is almost like when Michael Jordan went to play baseball. After basketball, see, I see. I've seen that ESPN thirty for thirty episode. They did a whole thing about him going to play baseball in the play minors. Baseball? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. I that's that's another way to put it. I like uh, yeah, I like except, the Shaq analogy. Except Fritz Lang didn't come back and do a three P and blah blah blah. But but yeah, I definitely agree with that. Totally. Uh, I was also going to say um, it it doesn't have a it doesn't have a quotable quite like uh, takes eat some cocaine Olympic. But it does. You're talking about that whole uh, the woman that's about to jump off of the building. Oh yeah. Um, there's a there's one line where the guy keeps her from jumping off, and she goes back inside. And there's that old guy uh, back on the ground, mm-hmm. and he says, he says, um, "Thank God, I, uh, 
I would not have enjoyed my dinner if that happened. But that was good. <laughs> yeah, that the was... fat guy on the ground level, he kind of pats his tummy and he goes, "Oh, thank God." He's like, "I just I wouldn't have in, enjoyed dinner yeah, if this." Uh, that was this... good. Yeah, and it's like the hotel staff tells her, "It's like, listen, honey, it's like you don't want to kill yourself. It would just be it would just be a major inconvenience for everyone." All of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Man. But is it not untrue? <laughs> Woo! Creeps is canceled podcast. <laughs> I think also what sums it up really well too is that intro scene where you know I mentioned the really good scene and testament with the with the shootout in the car. Well, not a shootout, but the the assassination. This movie starts out with uh, a substantially worse rendition of that scene like 30 years later i think that also pretty much sums it up a little bit too i wouldn't say substantially worse but if you had saw testament in freaking 1930 and then you saw this 30 years later you've been like wow they couldn't even they couldn't even top a scene they they did 30 years ago yeah it's and it's too bad but he was old right Hey, yeah, I'm sure the movie made some money. Hopefully, well, I mean, it goes and kicks off like a whole uh, a whole franchise of Mabuse movies in the '60s. Right, I mean, right. We, and, 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 yeah, we get uh, the return of Doctor Mabuse in '61, the Invisible Doctor Mabuse in 1962, the Terror of Doctor Mabuse in 1962, Doctor Mabuse versus Scotland Yard 1963, Ooh. the Death Ray of Doctor Mabuse in 1964, and I guess they they take a little bit of a break because the next Doctor Mabuse we get is directed our by none other than Jess Franco, The Vengeance of Dr. Mabuse in 1972. Did you watch that this week? I did not, because uh, it's, really it's, av- it's not available. But uh, then we get a, we got a real uh, humdinger, though. We get a topper of Dr. M from 1990, mm. directed by Claude Strabol, the, uh, mm. a much-beloved uh, man of cinema, directing movies such as Le Ceremony, uh, Le Boucher, Mm. Uh, story of women, real classy guy, but he directed this mm-hmm. like love letter called Doctor M. Uh, in, in the not too distant future, Berlin is shocked by a series of spectacular suicides. A policeman's wow. investigations lead him to a beautiful, enigmatic woman, and the revelation of a sinister plot to manipulate the population through mass hypnosis. Mm. Wow! Hey, you forgot one though. Uh, one? The 2022 Call to Mabuse by Christopher Nolan. Oh, shit. Well, when, mm. it, when, when it gets made, RJ, it'll be on that list. Hey, you give me five minutes with Chris Nolan, and I, I bet I could get a lot of movies made. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, um, so we I think we can all agree that it's uh, some diminishing returns here at the end sure. of uh, Lang's career. That's okay. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Mm-hmm. It's all good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys want to hear about who hates the testament of Dr. Mabuse? Hell Mabuse? Yeah. Hit it. All right. First up, we've got Jeff Naveen with one star who just writes, rather uninteresting, a precursor to noir, nice Donkey Kong barrel throwing scene, and wow. a psychology scene with the stadium seating that I have seen before. I like I mean- I liked M- Mixner. <laughs> I think I, uh, that Donkey Kong toss was worth at least two stars. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. agreed. And that's what I'm saying. I even mentioned the DK toss when I was talking about it. I didn't know about this dude. Yeah. Uh, this dude has some questionable taste. They Don't they always? They always do, Jarrett. They always do. They gave Godzilla half a star. Which one? They gave sh- the Godzilla what half a star? Oh God damn it! Uh, they gave Desataroya half a star, Jarrett. Desataroya, <laughs> uh, Strange Brew half a star, Muholland Drive half a star, Jarrett. Mm-hmm. Dumb and Dumber and Billy Madison half a star, and then their only five star films are like Field of Dreams, Avatar, True Lies, and Terminator <laughs> Two. What what are these what are these people doing watching Testament of Doctor Mabuse? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I. I. I don't know. 
All right. Uh, okay. Gr- Graham Austin, two and a half stars. There are some slightly okay. lower ones, but they're too long. Sure. Lang demonstrates his mastery of visual storytelling and the atmosphere of anxiety right from the offset of this film with a masterful opening sequence that plays with sound design and in a unique way that, despite the lack of dialogue, shows that he understands what makes sound films work. Unfortunately, he seems to have forgotten all that technique for most of the rest of the movie, which may as well be a radio play for how much exposition is dumped between characters standing around in rooms. This is true. Uh, There are still moments of brilliant visuals throughout and a creeping sense of unease that capitalizes on the ideological themes. It's just a shame they couldn't be explored more through action, but they are far uh, too few in a story that seems to be told in the wrong medium. It's a strange backslide after M so thoroughly capitalized on Lang's transition to sound film as it takes this movie until late in the third act to remember it's a movie again i never forget that it's a movie when you watch it because i remember true (laughs) Um, sounds like he likes to read slant a little bit i I, maybe i i'm not totally familiar but i'm gonna take your word for it uh i mean the person doesn't have horrible film taste jarrett I don't Favorite. even think this is a particularly awful review or anything like that. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, I could see that. There is definitely mm-hmm. a lot of exposition. Yeah, I mean, it's not the worst stuff. Favorite films are like Notorious, High and Low, Sweet Smell of Success, Blowout. Just like real real criterion type stuff. Yeah. Those, are all, those are all better movies. Yeah, they are. I just went to their all-time stats to see uh, what I could f- figure out here. Uh, their most watched director, Sam Jackson, most, or not Sam Jackson, most watched actor, most watched director is his Hitchcock. Well, there's nothing interesting here. Mm-hmm. Never sounds mind. Sounds like he'd rather, sounds like he'd rather watch a bunch of mimes play tennis than uh, some ghosts, uh, doing their thing. I mean, that's probably what, what he's doing, except they did give, no, nah, never mind. <laughs> never mind, Jared. I'm going to leave you on that. You'll All never right know. then. All right then. And finally, know. Jackson Beeb, BB, two and a half stars. Just didn't understand it. Jesus forgive me. <laughs> they uh, they just gave Eraserhead three and a half stars. Hmm. But they also gave Fight Club five stars, Jarrett. Yeah, they did. I mean, and some of the other movies, like other five star films are like Lighthouse, Boogie Nights and Her. So it's like, those are good movies. They are. Those are good movies. And you don't have to love Eraserhead, but like you should <sighs> Half star films are like Neil Breen and Transformer movies. So, oh, don't leave Neil Breen alone. Uh, one star films are Man Bites Dog and Battlefield Earth and then the new Predator film. Here, let me find out which Neil Breen this is, since you're such a big fan. Uh, I am here now. He gave. I have, oh, I see. I haven't seen that one. That's I think one of his and new ones. Alien Bean. Whoa! <laughs> add this to my alien list. There you go. Nice. nice. Can I ask a question about let- Letterbox? Yeah. Sure. Sure. What, what What's the What's this whole reviewing thing? If this is this like. The, the 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 catalog of reviews that that that, that you toss out has yeah. me so confused what what their prerogative is is this just like the, are they are they just uh picking movies out of a hat to review what, what what's the goal yeah, here? It's, it's basically just like it's like it's like if i watch a movie whatever i watch i just log it and then if i choose i can write a review for it uh, some people do do that, and I guess one of the reasons we do this segment is uh, kind of for mm. the pain and suffering of reading sometimes people's very badly written reviews or like <laughs> very like like overly hostile reviews, mm-hmm. like over, just yeah. to so it's just like how aggressive they are, like because when you like say a movie is like a half star movie, it's like okay, you're saying this is amongst one of the worst films ever created in my mind, or like it's mm. so objectionable on some level, you better have like a pretty good justification for why it's bad. And mm. uh, that's what, that's what we do it for. Cause it's like the idea that like, oh, who, who, who hates criteria movies? So yeah, like, you know, we have no idea who any of these people are. Uh, yeah. you, like, but once they log it, they're public, you can just click through, uh, make a selection of, uh, 
selecting it by like lowest reviews and people who've actually yep. reviewed a movie and that's it and so you can see that you can do it on the flip side and see who of the highest rated movies but what's the fun in that i don't mm-hmm. i don't want to hear people being enthusiastic about like seven samurai i want to know who really hates seven samurai sure see you see that's exactly what i'm talking about like what like i definitely uh, from your guys' perspective looking at it as entertainment i can definitely see why these things exist but if like you know, uh, the, the whatever Schmohawk is gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna go. Um, <laughs> he's gonna do Mulholland Drive, then he's gonna do Terminator, then he's gonna do Transformers, and then he's gonna do an uh, Ozu movie. Where, where's the like? What's well, a, what's on his watch list? Like, where are these things bouncing around for? That that's what blows my mind. Like, like it would make sense if they have seven hundred reviews and it's everything mm-hmm. from top to bottom, but it's just the most random hand-picked thing that, part of that's our part of that's actually rj <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, yeah so, so what i when Jarrett picks out and this is for the mabuse fans out there this is this behind the scenes how the sausage is made Jarrett, like <laughs> he doesn't show me before and i know what we do so i'll just pull up the movie and i'll sort it by lowest reviews uh and then when he reads off the name then i click on it and then i go to their five star films and then their half star films and i just pick things out that stand out to me personally so yeah. it's oh, very okay, biased okay. yeah yeah it's not like however, it's not, yeah. <laughs> however though jared we have found some like very strange occurrences where there's been like accounts where it's an account will have been created 2 years ago they watched 50 films most of them were like normal films. And then it was like one criterion movie or like a movie like swamp woman from Roger Corman. And that's the one we pick out. And it's like, it's like a criterion movie mixed with like a bunch of these like new mainstream movies. And you're like, none of this fits together. So it does happen. It's just, I I pick it randomly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is more of a snapshot of the architecture of RJ's mind. That's why it's so (laughs) random. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, by random, I think people have kind of associated me with the Mabuse brain uh, that you see in Testament of my doctor, yeah, doc, my doctor Mabuse. I was going to say the Safety brothers are going to find you someday and get to work. I mean, if they, if someone would just kind of, if they want, if a friend of the show, a listener wants to push <laughs> our stuff towards them and they say, you got to study this guy because he is different uh i i I can't suggest that because uh, that'd be using my influence in uh, a way that is unsavory but uh someone else out there wants to do it uh go ahead right here hey well viewers at home you heard the man there you go there you go go. Mm -hmm. um so any final thoughts on testament of dr mabuse and the works of fritz lang Uh, Not for me, but uh, Ryan, do you have any other thoughts or ideas or anything you'd like to say about uh, Testament or any of the Mabuse? Um, Just going to reiterate one more time. If you got a limp limp dick, you got to eat some Coke. Apparently that's... Specifically eat some Coke. Yeah, It's the cure-all, I guess. Uh, Guy downtown told me that uh, he swears by it. So uh, who's to say he's wrong, right, Jer? Do you, do you guys have any jib? Any what? Jib. Never what? mind. After the break, um, we are going to send our minds into yours. You. And, and continue watching podcast movies because we're stupid. What? Are very, you talking about me? Very stupid. <laughs> Why do we do this, RJ? Why? 